A lot of scientific research that came out about this cloth, beginning in the, probably in the early 1980s, there was a, a lot of interest because the, the cloth had been scientifically studied by a team of 29 scientists in 1978 and going into the published all of their findings about it. So I was really pulled into that because the great mystery of this cloth was, and still is, Nobody can explain the image that's on it. Nobody can explain the image formation process. With all of our great technology today, everything we're capable of doing in the 21st century, no one can replicate the image. So that's, that's a big part of what, of what I'm going to talk about. So then in 1988, I was in graduate school. I was working on uh, my, my PhD, and there was, I actually just entered a PhD program, and the very, um, that very fall, there was a major headline that hit every world newspaper, and it was, The Shroud of Turin is a Medieval Fake. Okay? And that was because the cloth was carbon-14 dated that year by a team of three scientists, three universities. And I think, like many people, I took kind of took a step back from it and thought, well, okay, my interest is medieval, is medieval history. So if this is a medieval artist who did this, I want to know more about this person. I want to know more about this process. I want to know more about what other artworks this person may have created, because this is phenomenal, right? Well, fast forward, and Shroud never, never, never really let go of me, continued to study, the, especially, especially the history of it, continued to study, continued to publish, continued to present about it, and then in 2019, very recently, that carbon-14 dating has been called seriously into question, leaving everyone in the international community today facing the very real possibility we are talking about a first century date, okay? So this is a really exciting time to be talking about this cloth again. So for those of you that don't know much about it, I'll begin with the basics. It is a 14 and a half foot strip of linen cloth. It bears, and this is important, how many of you have ever watched CSI? CSI, or you know about crime scene uh, investigation, right? Okay, so think about this as a crime scene because this cloth bears the forensically accurate image of a man <clears throat> who has been scourged and crucified in Roman fashion, okay? And when I say forensically accurate, I am talking about a real human being. It is anatomically perfect as a human being. This man was about five foot 10 inches tall. He weighed about 160 pounds. We know a lot about his physical features as you'll see from the cloth itself. And, um, and so what, what's interesting about it is the more we study it, the more we have studied it, the more questions we have. Okay, I want y'all to think about something. It's kind of a philosophical challenge. If you have an object that man makes, an object of the material world, can you study it and begin to understand how man made it? And how can we do that? Because we too are people. So we understand human processes. We can we can undo human processes and begin to understand how something was done. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The more you study something that is material, the more you understand it. The opposite of that is what applies to the, to the Shroud of Turin, because the more we study it, the more questions we have. We never get to the end point of our knowledge. So that is one feature of the cloth that's always intrigued me. It has been studied more, y'all, than any other object known to exist. Every single academic discipline, certainly in the 30 plus years I've been doing this, it has been studied more from every perspective. Biology, chemistry, physics, botany, history, art history, um, imaging specialists, nuclear physicists. I mean, you name an academic discipline <clears throat> and it has been brought to bear on this call. So why do we not understand it? That is a great mystery, okay? For those of you that are not familiar, what I'm showing you here is actually, this is the, uh, what the eye, the naked eye sees. Again, this is a 14 and a half foot strip of linen cloth. So what you're looking at here is what we call the frontal image. This is uh, the, the front of the man. You see his arms crossed in front of him right here. Actually, the arms are across the pelvis right here. Um, this is the front of the man. This is what we call the dorsal image, the back of him. So, so this actually is a, is a uh, photographic negative, and more about that in just a minute. But um, you can see that in the photographic negative, all the detail really comes out. You see a lot more of this in, in, in just a minute. But for those of you that need to orient yourselves to how the image was, was formed, 
Think about a 14 and a half foot strip of linen laid out. And when I talk to little kids, I always bring one, right? And I make somebody lay on it so I can demonstrate it. Um, 14 and a half foot strip of linen. Uh, a, a burial shroud would work like this. You would put place the body on one half of the linen, and then you would take the other half and fold it over the top. Does that make sense? So when this image was formed, this captured both the front side of the person who was in it and the back side. Okay? Does that kind of help you understand? Orient yourself to why it looks the way it does? Okay. All right. So this is what we, and I don't want to give you too much of a, this is not intended to be a history lecture, even though that is what I have to. I'm not going to give you a history lecture, but you have to know the points on, uh, in the history, uh, or in, or in, doesn't make as much sense. Okay, so we know it enters the documented history in the 14th century. It shows up in Leray, France. It's in the possession of a knight named Geoffrey de Charny, who had served in the Hundred Years' War. We don't know how he came to possess it, but he builds a chapel in Leray, France, and he puts it on public display. By 1532, that family, the de Charny family, had already transferred it to another family. Uh, now, this is kind of an important name, the House of Savoy. They were a dynastic family in Italy. They produced the kings of Italy. The last king of Italy was Umberto II, who died in 1983. Okay, so hold that thought. Because he transfers it to the Savoy family. The Savoy family builds a chapel in Chambary in France to house it. And there's a fire there in 1532. So if you look at, let's go back just a second real quickly. Um, if you look at the cloth with the naked eye, what you see is there's a parallel set of scorch marks that runs the entire length of the linen. That's because of the way the shroud was folded and placed into a metal reliquary, a metal box, and stored in this chapel in Chambéry. So the fire heated up that metal box, and that's why you have that parallel set of scorch marks, okay? Now that's important, hugely important. If it was a test question, this would be it. 1534, there's a repair to the cloth that took place, uh, and I've actually been to the site, there's a, there's, it's a holiday inn today, but it was, a, it was a, a convent, and they had a room upstairs where they took this cloth and very lovingly repaired it. There were places that they thought had been damaged by the fire, so they sewed patches on it, they put uh, a backing cloth on it, and what we know now, let's go back to this image again, uh, is that in the very top left corner of the cloth, it's a little bit further down than this because you're only looking at part of it. The very top left corner, they strengthened the linen by weaving in new fibers, cotton fibers, not linen, cotton fibers. The poor Claire's, the, 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 the order sisters who did this, they didn't know they didn't know that there's a difference really that would be chemically different between linen and cotton. They're two different things, two different substances, right? Y'all with me so far? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So that's important. Where did the repair take place? Top left corner. Top left corner. Okay, everybody everybody, hold that, all right? That's the chapel I was talking about. I've been to in Chambéry. This is where it was stored. Uh, actually behind the high altar here, there was a little niche in the wall. And if you go there today, you can actually still see the scorch marks that run up the, the stone into the ceiling where, where the fire was, and they rescued it from that, from that place. All right, the next major thing that happens is it moves to Turin in 1578. Now we know it's been there ever since. It's been to Turin. It uh, actually can never leave Turin because in 1983, the last living Savoy, King Umberto II of Italy, willed it like as an item, he willed it to the living Pope, who at the time was Pope John Paul II. And Pope John Paul II became the personal owner of the shroud. It does not belong to the Roman Catholic Church. A lot of people think it's a Catholic thing, right? The Catholic, it's housed in the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, for most of its history, has taken care of it. Today, it's cared for by a group of men under the direction of the Archbishop of Turin. But it does not belong to the Catholic Church. It belongs to the Pope. So today it belongs to Pope Francis as an individual, right? It's been there ever since, with the condition it can never leave Turin, by the way. It can never leave there. 
Now this is fascinating because in 1898 we saw the first photograph. Secunda Pia was an, was an uh, uh, amateur photographer who went to the house of Savoy, the Savoy family, and said, I'd like to photograph the shroud. He was trying out his new camera. I'm going to show that to you. Um, <laughs> there's his sophisticated equipment, right? So what you have to do, and I know in, in an age of iPhones it's hard for, for us to understand, but you would have to take a prolonged exposure on a glass plate. The glass plate is about 12 by 12 by 12, 12 by 16, something like that, depending on the camera format. You have to take a prolonged exposure with light. It takes several minutes to capture this image on uh, on a plate, and then you would take that glass plate into a uh, into a dark room and you process it. So Secunda Pia wanted to try out his camera. This is his photograph, uh, the in the positive form. Okay. Um, this is always a challenge for me to tell young people explain positive and negative photography. Do you know that you have a setting on your iPhone where you can take a photograph and you can reverse that out, reverse out the, the contrast, lights and darks? Okay, good. Think of it that way. Think of it that way. All right, let's go back. So the first, first photograph happens. Now, when Secunda Pia went into his dark room and he processed his plate, he was the very first one. I want you to think about this. We know that for centuries, medieval pilgrims probably got on their hands and knees and would crawl forward to pray before this cloth because they believed it was the burial cloth of Christ. They had been told it was. They didn't question the authority. They didn't question the knowledge. They just accepted it. And they didn't know what we now know. They never saw what Secunda Pia saw. The very first time that, that, that there's a photographic reversed image of the shroud, you see the image of a man who has been beaten very badly. His left wrist is pierced. He's been capped with something on his head that is spiky, that has left some, some puncture wounds, some of which bled very profusely. Um, you can't see the bottom of his feet in this particular image, but there's a large puncture wound at the feet, lots of blood. Again, um, he's the first one to ever see this. Okay? Now, guys, that was the first imaging characteristic that we learned. When you look at the photographic negative of the man, you are actually looking at him as if he were standing here in front of you. It is the exact inverse of the way photography works. If you took a photograph on film or on a glass plate, again, remember again, going back to those lights and darks being reversed, if you, you should be able to look at me in my positive form and you would see a negative with my lights and darks reversed. Yes? Y'all with me? So which one of those is the positive of me? Me standing here, not the photographic one. This shroud does not photograph that way. The man's image is positive only in its photographic negative form. I know I'm asking for a reach here again for people that might not necessarily understand old school photography. But trust me when I tell you nothing else photographs this way. Trust me when I tell you that. And we have tried. Nothing photographs this way. Nothing. The second thing that happens is in 1976, there's a group of scientists who are working to try to develop a, um, some kind of technology that would allow them to take photographs that were coming back from outer space and to take those photographs and analyze them for dimension so that you would know, for instance, if you have a, think about having a photograph of the moon, okay? And you can see that there is something that looks like a crater or something that looks like a mountain. Well, if you, if you run that through this particular analyzer, what it would do is it would pull out the relief. So you would see, be able to see, okay, there's the mountain on the moon, right? It would pull it out in like three-dimensional, or actually two-dimensional, not, not three-dimensional, two-dimensional kind of relief. You could see, okay, the mountain on the moon is this high. The crater is this low. Does that make sense? Otherwise, you're just looking at a flat image. So when they were working on this project for NASA, um, there was a scientist uh, at the Air Force Academy, a physicist by the name of Dr. John Jackson, who was in the room and he said, you know, I said, I have an interest in this cloth, this, this artifact called the Shroud of Turin. Can I take a photograph of that and run it through this analyzer and just see what it does? And when they got the result, 
um, every single person in the room, including um, a Jewish scientist um, and, and a self-professed atheist scientist, everybody in the room said, you've got to take a group, a team, to Turin to study this cloth because of what they saw. And I'm going to show you that. The image in the cloth is three-dimensional. Not two-dimensional, not quite one-dimensional. It is three-dimensional. This cloth actually wrapped a human man who had been beaten, who had been, who had been crucified, who had been capped with thorns, and oh, by the way, he was also pierced in the right side. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And it is in perfect 3D relief. Every place the cloth touched the body, there is, there is this dimensional relief. So what scientists have been able to, and again, by the way, nothing else run through the analyzer produces this kind of result. And again, they tried hundreds and hundreds of photographs to duplicate this, and nothing does this. It's the only one that gives us a three-dimensional, perfect three-dimensional result. So this is the two things, if you took nothing else away today, other than that test question I gave you already, if you took nothing else away today, it is that there are two characteristics of this image that are unlike anything else in the world. The eye sees the photographic negative. That's what you see with your naked eye. That's not how it's supposed to work. And the image has three-dimensional information actually encoded in it. So that if you were, anybody ever watched an animated movie? Animated, or anything animated, anime, anything? So what, what um, happens in that process is that um, designers will, will write a code, right? And, and give form to a, um, a person, a creature, and then that the computer will run that code and it will bring it out in like a full 3D um, relief. So think of it that way. If you took the image, the, the information that's already in encoded in the cloth, and you were to extract it, um, we are able, let me back up and show it. I'm going to strip for just a minute. This is, this is what you get. This is what you get. This is the position of the body, exact position of the body, at the time the image was formed. Now, how do we know that? You remember? Because the, the, the cloth itself tells us it has spatial information in it. We know that, for instance, places where the, the, the body did not touch the linen, there is less density of information. Then places where, for instance, here at the buttocks or the shoulders that actually touch the claw, the face that touched the claw, right? There's more density of information. So, so scientists are able to take that data from that BP-8 analysis, and they can tell you this is the position of the body. The flexion of the neck, the flexion of the knees and the feet. Look at how the feet are, are, are hyperextended. This tells the medical forensic expert, that this body was in rigor mortis at the time that the image was formed. So rigor mortis sets in, for those of you that, that don't know this, when, you, when uh, a person dies, the muscles stiffen. It's the immediate reaction of the body, the muscles stiffen. And that uh, uh, stiffening of the muscles lasts for about uh, 48 to 36 hours. Okay? And it begins to completely resolve itself. So this image was formed, this, this man was um, was in a state of rigor mortis, the image was formed in the cloth before the rigor mortis resolved. So in about a three-day window. Okay? In a three-day window, the image was formed. You can see the forensic interpretation of all the wounds of the body are placed on here as accurately as possible from the shroud. This man was beaten badly. We'll talk about that in just a second. Okay. So this is that research project I was telling you about. It happened in 1978. Um, you have a team that goes to Turin, they get unprecedented, unrestricted access to the cloth. They can perform every test on it they want to. And this is what they found. The summary of their findings, uh, and again, I, I hate to read to people who can read, but some of these points are really, really important. Uh, much of this I've already told you. This is a human being. He was capped with thorns. He was crucified. He was pierced in the right side. Um, there are um, over 360 identifiable separate wounds on his body. And by the way, by the way, 
those wounds that you see, the chest, the arms, all the way down the front of the legs, all the way down the back of the legs, uh, all the way up the back, the neck of the man, he was beaten by two men, each holding the same weapon. One of the men was taller than the other. How do we know that? CSI people, how do we know that? Directionality of the wounds. So one man's on the right side, one man's on the left side. They one of them is taller than the other. The directionality of the wounds tells us this. Two different men with the same weapon. The weapon aligns perfectly with the first century Roman flagrum. It is a whip that has three cords, and each at the end of each cord there is some kind of a metal ball. So if you looked at each one of these wounds underneath the microscope, which we have done. Here's what I found. Hello, Siri. Um, <laughs> If you looked at each one of these under a microscope, they're identical. The wounds are identical. They were made by the same weapon, and it aligns perfectly with the Roman flavor, um, which means that the man actually had 120 lashes, not the 39 that some people traditionally ascribe because of, of Jewish law. Romans don't go by Jewish law, so let's assume this is Jesus and he's sentenced to, to be scourged. He could have gotten 120 lashes. Okay. Um, the blood is present before the image, which is kind of an interesting thing. We don't talk about enough, I think. Uh, that's kind of an interesting phenomenon that you would have blood on the cloth before the image appears. There are no paints or dyes anywhere in the linen, but here's, here's the CSI um, component. This is the good stuff. We know we have an environmental journey for this cloth. We know where it's been. How do we know that? 56 separate pollen species that have been identified. Very specific kind of soil that's in the face, the bridge of the nose, the knees, and the feet. This man fell, fell at some point, and probably face planted because of the amount of dirt that they, they, had, they were able to vacuum out of this area of, of the head. Uh, and there are traces of aloe and myrrh. Now this is interesting uh, around the head because aloe and myrrh are two substances that are used in Jewish anointing rituals for burials. So that's an interesting find. That was made about, about 10 years ago. They identified the aloe and myrrh that were taken from, from, uh, from uh, samples around the head area. Okay, there's the, the position of the body. The cloth itself is fascinating. It's a three over one weave, um, which which is unusual because most ancient and medieval cloths, if you were to say, if you're gonna to try to argue that this is a 14th century linen, okay, let's take that position for a minute. This would be very unusual in the medieval world because it's, it's an expensive cloth. Do you know that the simplest way to weave something is to go one over one over one over one, right? You hang your vertical threads, you bring across a horizontal thread, yeah? So, to have a three over one weave is makes this a very expensive linen. So whoever owned this cloth was someone who had money, someone of means, a rich man, a rich person. Now, um, to take this just a little bit, uh, a little bit further, I, I want to to touch upon. And I don't normally do this, but I can do this here. I want to touch upon one of the. Um, the aspects of the gospel narratives that we have. We read the passion narratives of Christ in, uh, in, in the gospels. They tell us that, um, that Jesus, remember, remember who went and asked for Jesus' body for burial? Anybody remember who it was? Hmm? Well, the, well, the rich man, Joseph of Arimathea. Does this ring a bell with y'all? Okay, good. So, um, we're told that, and we're also told that it was in his tomb that Jesus was placed, right? He gave Jesus his tomb, the rich man, Joseph of Arimathea. Well, here's a Jewish factoid for you. If this Jewish man, Joseph of Arimathea, already had a tomb for himself, guess what else he owned? A shroud. He already owned a shroud for himself. Now, I have some Jewish friends, practicing Jewish friends, who will tell you, I actually have a friend in Colorado who's Jewish who speaks about the cloth. He was the documenting photographer on this project. He's still Jewish. But he will tell, he's told me on the phone before, Cheryl, something happens to me, my shroud's on the top of the closet. 
Jews to this day are buried wrapped in shrouds. Okay? So <clears throat> this, this is very interesting because it tells us it was an expensive linen. The blood on the shroud is human. It is type AB. That's been verified by many more laboratories than I could list on this, on this cloth. But it is definitely human blood. Okay? We know that now, we, today we know that it is also, it is male. It is male. Um, and uh, we don't know any more about it. People always ask about the DNA. I'll say that for a question if you want to ask, but no, we don't know. This makes it a forensic match for another cloth. Okay, if you open up John's Gospel and you read chapter 20, which is where the resurrection narrative is, okay, see if you remember this story, that Peter and John run to the tomb, right? They get to the tomb, John stops, Peter runs in. John hangs back, and John's the one who's writing the account. And John says this, we saw the burial linen lying there, including the cloth that had covered Jesus' head that was rolled up in a place by itself. Okay, John is the only one that gives us this detail. The other evangelists tell, tell the, the resurrection narrative, but they don't tell us this detail, presumably because John was an eyewitness and saw it. So he, he tells us it's there. Well, this cloth is, many people believe to be that cloth, this other cloth that John's talking about. This cloth has been in Oviedo, Spain since the year 613. It showed up in Oviedo, Spain in a reliquary, an ancient reliquary that was supposed to have belonged to the Apostle James. That's the tradition behind it. So this cloth has been carbon-14 dated. It dates to about the year 100, give or take a few decades on either side. The pollens are a match for those on the shroud, and most importantly, it is a forensic match. There's 120 points of congruity between the blood, spain, blood spatter and blood stain on this cloth. You can see where it's pressed around the eyes. And the shroud. This cloth covered the face of the same man who's in the shroud. Right? Now, you see this blood stain right here? Kind of shape, in the shape of a cross, actually, from the back of the head. This is identical. Under microscope, it lines up perfectly with the, with the stain that's on the back of the head of the man in the shroud. So, forensic experts testify that this cloth covered the same face of the cloth that the shroud was ran covered. Same man. Same blood type. Same blood spatter. Same blood flow. And we know where this, is cloth, where this cloth has been since the year 613. I mentioned six, uh, 56 different plant pollens. The one that's most prominent around the head and neck area is this one, Gondelia torniforti is what it's called. It's a blooming thorn. Um, it actually is about the size of a soccer ball. That kind of doesn't give you any perspective. It's a large bloom. But, and it blooms in the early spring, early to mid spring. And when it stops blooming, it's native to the Middle East. When it stops blooming, it dries up kind of like a tumbleweed. You know what a tumbleweed is? Mm -hmm. It would literally just break off and be rolling through the streets or rolling through the, the countryside. Uh, this Gondelia torniforti produces a, a thorn that's about two and a half, three inches long. Mm -hmm. a, a, a mass of them. It would be like a ball of thorns. And this is the, the one we find most commonly uh, the head and neck area. But there, of the 56 pollens, there are seven that are unique to the Middle East, which again, tell us where it has been. We know the cloth has been in Western Europe, pollen-wise. We know it's been in Western Europe. We know it's been around the Straits going into the Black Sea, uh, where Turkey is, right? Constantinople, the ancient city of Constantinople. It's been there. It's been in a region of Turkey called Edessa. It's been in a region uh, near uh, Antioch. So we, we got this kind of broad distribution, but there is only one place in the world that three of the pollens are found together. And you can see it right there, Jerusalem. At some point, this cloth had to be in Jerusalem. So if I commit a crime in Shreveport, Louisiana today, and I travel, let's see where the next place I'm going is. I travel to Orlando, Florida, uh, and uh, I have this jacket on. How would they be able to put me in Shreveport, Louisiana? CSI. What could they do with my jacket? Analyze it. See. For what? Fibers, pollens, 
pollens. They would be able, the pollens have a unique geographic signature. They would be able to place me in Shreveport, Louisiana, or at least North Louisiana, okay, just by taking my jacket. So this is good, hard science that tells us forensically where this stuff is turned. Okay? So the evidence from that we have from the soil is really interesting. That soil I mentioned that was taken from the, the eye socket area here, the bridge of the nose, um, the knees, and the feet. They literally vacuumed this off the cloth in 1978 and put it in a Ziploc bag and labeled it dirt. Because nobody in 1978 had the technology to know where it came from. The developments that we have had in the years since, the, the way that geology has advanced as a discipline, we are able to take soil of any kind, anywhere, and we have imaging powerful enough now to identify at like a super, super, super microscopic level the unique signature that that soil has to a very specific part of the world. This is a limestone. It's been identified as travertine aragonite. This is it under extreme magnification. And it is a signature match for really only one place in the world, the old city of Jerusalem. The closest match is near the Damascus Gate, the old city, which if you, if you, if you studied the way of the cross, the way that Jesus walked from the Praetorium where he was sentenced uh, by Pontius Pilate to Calvary, uh, it's, it's a direct pass through the Damascus Gate. Now, this is kind of the sticky widget, right? I mentioned to you the carbon-14 dating. Mm -hmm. Three universities, University of, Ar of uh, Arizona, University of Zurich in Switzerland, and University of Oxford. So three really uh, prominent universities in the world came together, and they carbon-14 dated the cloth, and this is what they published, that the cloth could be no older than the year 1260, and 1390 was the outside window on that side. Uh, and so, so this is that, that little piece of evidence I mentioned to you that kind of made everybody take a step back and say, hmm, okay, well, carbon-14 dating is solid science. I mean, that's good, that's, that's good, that's good stuff. You know, we believe in science. Science is a valid way of knowing. So everybody kind of took a step back and this was where we sat with it for many years. Um, and then in 2003, one of the men who was on the original Sturt team, this, this bugged him and bugged him and bugged him. And interesting, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about his personal story. He was an atheist. He was a chemist. He was a complete atheist. And he couldn't really let go of this for some reason, as he said in his later years. He couldn't let go of this. So he went to try to find the information about the testing. Um, the protocol called for these scientists to take six different samples. Do y'all know how carbon-14 dating works? Anybody know? You take, you take a piece of organic matter and you burn it. You set it on fire. You burn it. And then you measure the burn time. And that gives you a, a, a date. For, for organic materials, this works really, really, really well. You get like a, a, a window. And I greatly oversimplified that, but you get the picture. So as a chemist, he couldn't make this work. Because, again, as our technology advanced, we were able to take images of the shroud and look at them under all kinds of different light. Like we could look at it under ultraviolet light. We didn't know about that until, until the late 20th century. Um, we could look at it under different kind of fluorescences, different, different kinds of, of imaging techniques. And this one chemist looked at it under ultraviolet light and he said, wait a minute. You would expect that if it's all the same material, it would look exactly the same. The entire cloth under ultraviolet light is the same thing you see with the naked eye. It's this kind of sepia, beige color throughout. Except one area of the linen fluoresces a bright neon green. And I'm talking about green green. What area? Do you know why? Because that's where the poor Claire's introduced a different chemical substance. Cotton is not linen. Chemically, they're very different. So this man, Dr. Rogers, Ray Rogers is his name, 2003, said, well, hold the phone. Something is going on with carbon-14 dating. This can't be right. Where were the samples taken from? 
So he asked the, um, the British Museum, who was the uh, custodian of all the raw data from that testing, he asked them for the information and they refused to give it to him. Mm -hmm. I'll leave you to speculate that why that might be. Refused to give it to him. So fast forward, I mentioned Ray Rogers. Fast forward to 2019. This young man, Chris, uh, Tristan Casabianca, um, was an atheist, college student, um, law student. He converted to Christianity because he went to hear a, a presentation on the trial. And he got really interested in the carbon 14 dating. So he called up the British Museum and said, I want to see all the raw data from the 1988 test. And they told him no. So he sued them under the Freedom of Information Act, International Freedom of Information Act. You can't hold something that's been publicly presented as somehow private information. So he sued him, forced him to release it, and guess what? Where do you suppose those six samples were all taken from? The top left corner of this cloth. Now, I don't know if y'all know this, but do you know that taking one piece of linen about this big and cutting it into six pieces is not the same thing as taking six samples. But that's what they did. They violated their own protocol when they did the test. And here's a big kicker. University of Arizona didn't even test theirs. It's still in a vault. They didn't even do the test. Isn't science supposed to be objective? So what is the deal? What's going on then What's going on here? Why? And I don't know if you noticed the exclamation point at the end of that. I've always been really intrigued by that. Science is supposed to be objective. Why you got to put? Why why you got to put an exclamation point? Unless you've got some sort, and I hate to say it, but some sort of an agenda. These scientists went into this wanting to get a medieval date. Wanting to. Okay. All right, I'm not gonna run through all of that because we really don't have time. But I do want to get to this because this is the biggest challenge that we have today is understanding the image. I mentioned to you that we don't know how the image got there. Um, and, and there have been tests done with everything from nuclear fission to, um, to laser, excimer lasers, um, in, in an attempt to recreate the image. So Dr. John Jackson, I mentioned to him, mentioned him to you earlier, he's a nuclear physicist at the Air Force Academy, retired now, but he's dedicated his entire life to this cloth. He's still, he's still alive, he's still actively working in, uh, in this image formation research today. And he has computed it mathematically. He knows the amount of energy it took to create all 17 image characteristics, okay? There's six that are related to the cloth, 11 to the human in it. He's computed uh, all of it mathematically, and he would stand here today, and I'm ready to pick this talk, he would stand here today and tell you, it was 784 trillion watts of energy, but it was constant, it had to be concentrated, mathematically, it had to be concentrated in a very small area, 14 and a half foot square, uh, 14 and a half foot uh, strip of linen. It had to be concentrated in an immeasurable millisecond to an intensity of a burst of such that we can't recreate it in any laboratory in the world today. It cannot be, this amount of energy in that short of a time period cannot be replicated in any laboratory in the 21st century. And guys, 784 trillion watts, in case you don't know what that means, that will power New York's Manhattan Island for a year. That's how much energy we're talking about. It is a spectrum of light that did not burn it did not, this is not a scorch. The image is actually a saccharide. It's sugar. I can take a razor blade and scrape it off. It is so superficial, but it contains all of that information I just showed you. The complexity of this man is all captured in the very, very top fibers of a very thin linen cloth. It's mind-boggling. So this is the question nobody can answer, but he has, and he actually has an explanation. Okay, now I'm going to give you his fall through hypothesis. Now, what is a hypothesis? Uh, something you want to test, right? Okay. 
Well, here's the problem. We can't test it <laughs> because we can't get that much energy. So we can't test the hypothesis. So it remains a question. But here's what he suggests as an explanation for all 17 image characteristic is the only thing that matches is that the body that was within the cloth is the source of the energy. The body within the cloth had to be the energy. So that the body in the cloth became materially transparent, pure light, and the cloth literally collapsed through the body along the plane of gravity and collected all of the information about the man in the process. It's the only explanation that this physicist has been able to come up with. Okay? So we are left with two conclusions. It is either the burial cloth of Christ, it is authentically the burial cloth of one person of history, Jesus Christ. There's no other person in history who bears these unique wounds that we know of, capped with thorns, pierced in the right side, crucified and scourged with a Roman flagrum. Incidentally, we know the, the weapon that caused the wound in the side, too. It aligns perfectly with the first century Roman lance. Issued, guess where? To legions in Judea. It's either this. It really is. And we still don't understand the image process. We still don't know how the image got there. We can't reproduce it. It's either that or it is an artwork. It is an ancient or medieval artwork that was created by an unidentified artist who had advanced knowledge of all these things, who knew all about botany, human anatomy, blood spatter, forensics, and negative photography 700 years ago. One of those things. Now, I want to leave you with this real quick. Um, there's a, I mentioned that you can take um, all this data out of the um, the information that's embedded in the shroud, you can take it and recreate a three-dimensional reconstruction. And so there's an artist, uh, actually a, an Emmy Award-winning artist, he's worked on some Disney productions. His name's Ray Downing in California. He was really interested in this, so he took that information and created a model of the face. Uh, the only liberty he took here was he opened the man's eyes. He has one image of him with the blood stain that's on the forehead, and then one he's sort of cleaned up. Um, but the man has these kind of features, the elongated nose. Uh, we, obviously, we don't know the color of the hair, but the beard uh, is present. You can see it clearly on the shroud. And also, the other thing you see on the dorsal side uh, is that um, the man had the back of his hair pulled up in a long ponytail. The ponytail hangs to about the middle of his shoulder blades. You can see it on the back side of the shroud. But again, he's taking some artistic license because the man's eyes are closed in the shroud. But these are, this is the bone structure, the features of his face. All right. Questions for me? <laughs> yes. So you showed like the head wrappings. Uh huh. Uh, did they also take like a 3D image of that and use it opposite? There's no, there's no, uh, actually no image on it. So, so his head would have been covered when he came down from the cross. Okay. Because he was bleeding, he was bloody, brutal would have been covered. As soon as the, the women prepared his body for burial, they would have removed that from his face. But because, thank you for asking this question, because because the cloth had blood on it though, his blood, whoever this man was, because it had blood on it, it had to be placed in the tomb. Because the blood, under Jewish law, blood is part of the body. So it would have had to have been placed, had been buried with the body. So the body was then enshrouded without this cloth on his face. So there's no image. There's no image on that sumerian. Sweat cloth is what that means, by the way. Great question. Thank you. What else? I know that there are some stories um, in ancient history about a shroud that they don't know if it's this one or not, that in some church they built some sort of device, they think, that yes. they were lifted out of the box for, the, for it to be worshipped. Do you know what year that was that they think that, uh, that was written about. And the shroud actually was folded that way at some point. It's completely consistent with what we know about the fold patterns. Um, there is a, um, a record that we have from the year 1204. Um, a knight by the name of uh, Robert de Clary was sacking the city of Constantinople during the Fourth Crusade. And he describes something like that. He says that, that every Friday at the Church of St. Mary, we saw the image of our Lord at full length appear. So we think 
he may be referring to it being like in a device that could raise and lower. Um, there's also something that kind of sounds like that in Edessa in the sixth century. Um, so yeah, we do we do know we do know that it was folded that way, probably for that purpose, to be stored and raised, right? Raised and lowered. Yes. You said we could ask later about the DNA. Yeah. So there. So the the blood is so old that we cannot get a complete genome. Cannot get a complete uh, helix on it. Um, the, um, so anything you read on the internet about this, if they tell you that can be done, that's a lie. Don't believe everything you read on the internet. Um, so no, we don't know anything about him uh, other than it is type AB and it is male. And so I suspect maybe in the next couple of decades, in your lifetime, you'll probably surely see this, more and more, and more information. As we develop more sophisticated technologies that will allow us to test blood better, we may get uh, a DNA, and we may not. We may not. It might be, some theologians have, have speculated, it might be hidden from us. Yes? Have you seen the shot of the person? Yes, I have. I have. Uh, I was actually just there uh, most recently in July of this past year. Um, I work with the custodians of this cloth. There's actually men who take care of it literally every day. Uh, you wouldn't believe the work that goes into caring for this linen. It is in a reliquary that was designed by NASA so that it will never be in a fire again. It is literally in a, a, a metal encasement that you could shoot into outer space and could re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and not burn up. It's the same it's the same metal that they use on spacecraft, leaving and re-entering the atmosphere. The shroud's been in two fires. It was in a fire in 1532 and it was a fire in 2002. It was deliberately a fire set in, in 2002 um, um, to try to destroy it. And uh, so, so they said, no more. NASA come in here and design a reliquary. So I know those people. I get to have the great privilege of working with them pretty regularly uh, on the conservation of this linen. And uh, so this most recent visit in July, I was there for a few days, but I got to spend about an hour of private time. What else? Yes? Um, do you think they'll ever get to a point where they could actually test the hypothesis? We're going to have to be a lot more advanced um, than we are now in terms of harnessing that much energy. We just can't harness 784 trillion watts. We can't, we can't, we don't have the ability to do that. Yeah. The, the closest thing was probably a month ago when they tested nuclear fusion, they used. 600 billion watts and that was and, and that, that's a lot and yeah and that was the, they had been trying to save it for like two years for and we're test. talking about 784 trillion watts yeah. Yeah. Really? it's mind-blowing when you think about it when you think about the energy it took to do this and remember that we are talking about an energy that horrific amount of energy that does not burn it does not produce a heat light. Yes. So you, you kind of touched on this and it might be the same, but uh, in the book I heard a theory about, you know, like almost radiation, but all the radiation would be pointing upwards. Right. Is that? That's a theory. Would... That's that's one of the, 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 the hypotheses. Another hypothesis is that there are, there's a radiation from, from the body outward, that particles are spread outward. It's called particle, particle hypothesis. Um, there's some physicists that sort of ascribe to that, but that the one I mentioned with Dr. Jackson's is the most, is, the one, is really the only one that explains all of the image characteristics. So, it's a great mystery. It's a great mystery. And it's the reason it has turned loose in me for all these many years. Um, so if this interests you, I encourage you to, to go read about it. There's a website, it's real simple, it's called shroud.com. It is the largest clearinghouse of information on the web about this linen. You will read some crazy things on there too, because the man who runs it, uh, I mentioned him earlier, is a Barry Schwartz. He's a, he's a Jewish photographer. He was the original photographer on that uh, project in 1978. He runs the website today. He talks more about the Shroud of the World than any Christian I know. Doesn't he do TED Talks? He does. He's yeah. been all over the world. He still talks about the Shroud. He believes the Shroud, the man in the Shroud is Jesus Christ. He believes that. And he says, 
that as a Jewish um, as a Jewish messenger, he feels like he brings a more objective message. And he said, the man in Shroud, I believe, is a Jew. I believe he's the ultimate fulfillment of all Jewish prophecy. And as a Jew, why would I have to go anywhere else? I believe this. So he brings a very different perspective, and I think people are more inclined to listen to him. But, but my point is, he runs that website. And so he puts pretty much everything, files somewhere, everything that comes to him. But um, you'll be able to sort of parse through and, and, and see what's scientific and what's not. Because there's some crazy shroudies out there. Hi. Yes. Dr. White, is, is it, I read a, uh, one of the books that said that uh, there were coins over the eyes mm -hmm. of the man in the shroud, and they were able to decipher uh, the location of those, and that one of those may have had the inscription of Pilate, is that? Okay. So, so they're, they're talking about the lepton. It's yeah, the lepton. Yeah, first century uh, Roman coin. The problem is that, that it, it's almost like cloud watching, you know, mm. matrixing, like we can get an image, a, par a partial image of a coin. Some people see it, some people don't. Some imaging specialists say it's not really there. But I feel like, because one of the words is misspelled, and then we found out in the year 29 AD, there was a coin minted that had the misspelling, the exact misspelling. Mm. So the jury is kind of still out on that, but I think in the next decade, we'll have that resolved. Okay. Our imaging is getting so much better our ability to take things and really examine them, I think we'll know for sure. It would, it would very, be very compelling. I want that to be true. <laughs> I really want that to be true. So based on your your personal uh, studying, what is the conclusion of the, what is the, what is the, what does this mean for the rest of the world? The rest of if the world. this is authentic. If it is authentic, okay, here's, here's something that I, I would tell any person, um, Anywhere, what, no matter what their religious background was, whatever. This is a great mystery right now. So, so to be pulled into mystery, like if you don't know something, if you don't understand something, like we don't understand this shroud, you understand that every single one of us in this room right now is in a mystery, and we are already therefore in the presence of something greater than ourselves. Do you know that? When you're in mystery, you don't understand something, it's beyond you, you're in the presence of something greater than yourself. So this is what I tell people. If you, if we were able to say, we were able to find a receipt on the back of this that says purchased by Joseph of Arimathea at 3 o'clock on Friday afternoon, April 12th, 33 AD. Right? We can prove conclusively that this is the burial cloth of Christ. For somebody who is a believer in the resurrection, that's not a very big ask of us, is it? If, if they're able to, to, um, somehow debunk this and prove that it's not the burial cloth of Christ. People who are believers, it doesn't change your faith. My faith as a Christian does not depend upon this cloth being authentic, even as much as I've studied it. But what about the person who is a skeptic, who doesn't believe, the agnostic or the atheist? That's a much bigger ask for them, isn't it? They've got to step into a much bigger place. And so I think for people who do believe, it's our job to hold the message, right? We don't need this linen to be real, but but if somehow they can prove that it is, it is only a benefit to our faith. It's only a benefit. And why else, in a visual digital age, would we have this thing that nobody can understand? Remember the gospel will be preached to every nation, right? This is the fifth gospel. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. for having me.